Good evening. Uh, John Wirtz, Montgomery County Tea Party, and tonight we are going to interview J Jim Spiker uh, for the Lone Star Groundwater Conservation District position to you. Uh, it's September 20th, 2018, and with me are Del Fessenden, Bob Bagley, Dennis Tibbs, and Pat Tibbs. And Jim, welcome. Thanks for coming tonight. And uh, uh, as we discuss, go ahead and kick off with uh, you. You're welcome to uh, utilize up to five minutes in an opening, and then okay. we'll kind of jump into the Q&A system going around. Super. Well, first let me thank you guys for this. Uh, I, uh, I filled out the vetting application, and that was a, uh, an education in itself. So, and, I, and actually, I pro the reason I say that is I appreciate that. It made me think about things that I probably ought to get better at. And you're probably going to find that out in this interview, that I could get better still more. But it's the best. I've taken three or four of these now, and it's the best one I've, I've seen. It was the most decisive. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I... Uh, I'm 67 years old. I live in Montgomery County. I live uh, really not in the city anywhere. I live uh, a little bit east of Magnolia, close to the high school. And uh, I came here 11 years ago um, from California, was a Texas native, went out there and was held captive for about 17 or 18 years and then escaped and came back home. And I was enticed to come to Montgomery County uh, specifically Magnolia by my daughter who was teaching school there. And we had inherited an 18-year-old granddaughter to raise. And uh, so my beautiful, wonderful, patient wife of 48 years said, let's go to Magnolia. We've got a daughter there in the school system and, and it will be the best thing for our granddaughter. And uh, so we moved here and uh, it's uh, you know, I guess we just got lucky. So in spite of whatever problem Montgomery County has, it's been a very wonderful experience for us. Um, and I have two children, so I have a daughter that I spoke about, and then I have a son, and I have four grandkids. Uh, my, my, my background is, uh, is kind of unique. I, uh, I started out in the chemical business, uh, basically as a laborer and worked my way up to running a very large chemical plant for a company who is now Dow. Uh, and in the midst of that, I, I got an opportunity to help them improve safety in the, in the company. And I brought in a very small group of people, and I loved what they did, and so I left the chemical business and went into consulting. I did that 28 years ago. And, uh, I probably worked, I don't know, I've probably been in 3,000 companies in the last 28 years. I've worked in, I can't tell you how many countries, because I would tell you a number, but if I was wrong, somebody would come back at me at some point and say, you, you either worked in war or that. Um, and presently, I, I probably have 30 very senior executives that I coach, from CEO probably down to executive vice president, some of the biggest comp companies in the world. Um, I also do a tremendous amount of speaking. I spoke in Dodger Stadium Monday. Um, so, so I work this consulting company I work for, we sold five years ago. And they asked me to hang out and be sort of the face of the company and uh, do thought leadership and, and this kind of stuff. Um, I, like, I like to be outdoors. I'm, a, I'm an outdoors guy. I'm a hunter, a fisherman, a gardener. I, I just love the outdoors. That's sort of the stuff I like. And I've been so busy that I, that I really haven't had a chance to get involved in things like this. And just a few years ago, I, I just came to, a, when we sold the company, I'm not going to work like that anymore. So I have time now. I, uh, I, I probably work about half time. Maybe a little less if I can get away with it sometimes. But and so I so I got on the became the president of the Property Owners Association of Austin Manor. And uh, it's really basically the only sort of office that I've ever held. Um, I also am uh, on the board of directors of a little philanthropic organization composed of the retirees of the company I used to work for, and we help out 
the retirees of our that the retired who either didn't manage their money well or in a lot of cases sadly the kids have stolen their money from them mm -hmm. um, I'm also on the board of directors of the Inga Foundation which is the Interstate Natural Gas Association of America I'm on that board of directors of that foundation also um, I'm chief client officer of the company that I work for uh, and uh, so that that's sort of my I don't, I don't want to dwell too long on this, I don't want to waste all my five minutes. I want to talk about why I decided to get involved in this. And I, I don't... Am I down to two seconds? No. I'll do that in the close. Okay. There you go. Um, so you say you work for a consulting firm now. What, what, just real quick before I jump into some questions, what's the name of the consulting company and what type of work? The name of the consulting company is Dekra. D-E-K-R-A. They're a German company. They bought us out five years ago. Let's spell that again, please. D, D as in David, E right. as in Edward, K as in hero syrup, I guess. Okay. R-A. Okay. German. And it's a German. They're located in Stuttgart, Germany. And what do they do? And uh, it's an interesting, they're a non-profit company. They, uh, they started out in the automobile industry trying to make automobile safety in Germany a real thing. 100 industrialists put some money in a pot and started this company. And over the year, that was back in like 1920. And it has evolved and evolved and evolved and evolved to the point where they have uh, the goal of making the world a safer place, period. And so every penny that they make, they don't take a penny out of this company ever, never have. And every penny goes back into acquiring more resources to continue their mission. So they bought us. And then they have us now out buying companies in North America to, to fulfill this mission. So every penny of profit we make, we make profit. It goes into a pot and then it's used to do it. So that's a little bit about them. Okay. Yeah. What, um, so in the general sense of questions and what, and we asked what made you qualify to run this office and three reasons you believe you're the best candidate for the position. Uh, there's four items you listed, and the fourth is this organization without representation, meaning the groundwater district, yes. has run roughshod over residents of Montgomery County over water rights. Yep. This unelected group has imposed an oppressive tax on the residents of Montgomery County and with highly suspect means. Yes. Uh, I am questioning if the premise of the surface water are even valid in Montgomery County. That's yes. a scathing indictment. Yes. What, uh, tell us a little bit about your knowledge on that. You know, just for the folks yeah. out there, uh, what's going on here? So, what happened is in 2001, this thing got formed by the Texas legislature at the behest of somebody. I, I don't know enough about that, how that actually came, but, but it gave birth in 2001. And it, it was, uh, the directors to it were appointed and uh, they, they began to build an empire, basically. And when I began to look into this, when I got interested in this, and, and the way, that's sort of the way I got interested in it was I had really high water bills. I was really angry at our water provider. And every chance I got, I, I, I poked them. And then when I became the Property Owner Association president, I had to formally engage with them over a couple of water problems we had. And I found out that my high water bill really, really wasn't them. My high water bill was better than 50% pass-through fees to this thing called the SJRA, which I, I knew about the San Jacinto River, and I'd seen it on their trucks and stuff, but I, I, I had no real idea about what it was, so I started looking into it. And what I found out was, um, you know, they're trying to build all this infrastructure to take us off of groundwater and put us on the surface water. And in my career in the chemical business, I had run a surface water plant, and uh, a big one. And so I got to thinking, wow, I, I had a well in my first residence in Montgomery County, and even during the drought, I didn't even have to lower the pump. So why are we going to, is it really necessary? So I started digging in, and what I found was and this was a shocker to me, is that we have more surface water under, I mean, uh, groundwater under Montgomery County than all the lakes in Texas combined. 
And, and, and the other thing I did was I, then I started talking to hydrogeologists and what I found was this, uh, this uh, limitation on pumping was done basically to force people or to be able to give San Jacinto and, and uh, Lone Star the ability to force people off of groundwater. Now the reality is they're not forcing anybody off of groundwater in a sense. Not many people. What they're doing is having a whole lot of people pay for, ground, for surface water for a few people. And they're building all this infrastructure. And I started looking into what that cost, and that is ungodly amount of money. And so the more I dug, the worse it got. I, what I found out is they have a no conflict of interest clause in the, in the statute. So I could sit on the board of Lone Star right now and run a company that's building the pipeline with no, and that, that is, uh, to me, that's, that's insane. And then when I started thinking about my water bill, look, I can afford my water bill. There are a whole bunch of people in Montgomery County that are having to make a choice between letting their yard die and, and everything else and eating. And, that, and, and to me, that's, uh, that's unconscionable. Now, I could, I could, I could go along with something if it was nets. The trouble is that none of this is necessary. We have no groundwater shortage, and so this so thing was. You think it's a regulatory problem? Ground the the water shortage that is claimed to be happening in Montgomery County is purely regulatory induced. Okay. All right. That's Sorry. But I'll forgive my next yep. question. Okay. Uh, you said that. Uh, SRJA has SJRA has spent a huge amount of money uh, for what they have done. Um, do you think they overbuilt? Uh, do you think they overpaid? Would they have been able to do what they did for substantially less cost? Uh, on what all did you base your your comments? Your well, comments? so first, uh, I can tell you that. Uh, that plant could have been built a hell of a lot cheaper. I actually have been involved in a surface water. We built a surface water plant to supply the five or six biggest plants on the Houston Ship Channel. And I can tell you that dollar for dollar, we got a way better deal than they did. And furthermore, that plant's running at 40% capacity. So what was the cost on that again? Do you $500 million on, on this plant. Does that include plant. the pipeline nope. too as well? Nope. Five hundred just for the plant. Five hundred million dollars. So the one, you did, the one you did down in the uh, ship, channel. ship channel, how much? Many years that? earlier, but we built that plant for less than a hundred million. Wow. Way less than a hundred million dollars. And I, I can tell you, I bet you it right now is producing more water than this one is. Because this one's running at 40% capacity. Furthermore, the pipelines that they built not only are we having to pay for that, they caused, I just talked to a guy up here who owns a sign boss on 2978. He told me when they built the pipelines, they had to go through the creek behind his house. So they built a road across the creek so they could get back and forth. And while the roads were built, we had that big uh, May, just before Memorial Day rain two or three years ago, and water came into his house because of it, and they will not even talk to him about it. So there's all. I mean, I I know that in the scope of things, maybe that's small. It's not small to him. Well, normally they talk in court. Yes. Yeah, that's well. That, that's his, that's what them. they basically told him. You don't like it? Go to court. Huh? That's basically what they told him. Yeah. If you don't like what happened, go to court. Okay. So, so it sounds like it will be. A so so line yes line yes line. they overbuilt. Yes they paid too much. Uh, the reason they paid too much, I believe, is they have. A whole lot of this going on. If you start looking with a no conflict of interest clause in their thing, you know they pay too much. And in fact, the guy who launched the bonds to do this ended up with four million dollars. I understand in his pocket. Who was that? I don't remember the guy's name. Is that but, uh, the law firm here yeah. that does yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. all the all of that stuff? Swartz, Page, yeah. and yeah. Party. Yeah. Michael Page. Yeah, that's who it is. So when you start looking at all this stuff, you go, holy Toledo, what, what are we, these are people who are supposed to be representing us, and they're not. They're representing their, their pockets, so.
that and that angers me. Yeah, I think that's the same law firm that represents, uh, well, of course, SJRA at the time, the township, uh, the Rudd, the Muds. Yep. Uh, you know, it, yep. it's never ending. And, and they also sit on the financial review committee for the attorney general. Yeah, and, uh, and, and the interesting uh, thing is, I don't think statutorily, even combining the two agencies, they had the legal authority to create these uh, GRPs and and hold a gun to these people's heads and who force it, hold a gun to whose heads to all the water producers. So you got multiple small water companies, you've got multiple muds, you've got cities, incorporated areas, and what they basically told them is if you pump more than 10 million gallons uh, a year out of the ground, you have to join this GRP and you have to pay these pass through these fees. So they basically held a gun to their head because most of these people would have gone bankrupt had that stuck and they had no way to know. I mean, that's a big gamble. You know, you, you spend six months fighting in court and you lose at 10,000 bucks a day, you're bankrupt. You're so, done. So they, so they raised everybody's rates to pay for that. They, they, well, they put those pass-throughs. Yeah, that's what which, which caused everybody's rates caused to double. Caused everybody's rates to double. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As far as I can tell, there has not been a complete um, independent um, audit of the agency. Um, are, would you be willing to push forward with that? That is absolutely a non-negotiable. So, meaning? meaning, let me tell you what I mean by that. Look, they've done everything they've done pretty much in secret. And I'm, I'm, I'm not the dumbest guy in the room, but I'm not the smartest guy in the room either. And there's questions I can't answer. And until we get an independent third party outside audit of what's going on here. See, I think we need a legal audit too to tell us what our, what are, what authority do we have to start unreeling some of this stuff that's already been, the, the cat's out of the bag. Can we do any of that? And what kind of illegal shenanigans have gone on? I think that's got to be discovered too. So I think we have to have a legal and a financial audit of this, of this thing. And let me say this, going forward, I think it ought to be just as regular as clockwork. I think once a year or something like that, we ought to bring in a third party and open our vests and let them look. This, uh, to me, that's, that's what the government's supposed to be. It's supposed to be us being able to see what the people who work for us are actually doing, and we don't have that over there at all. Put checkbooks online. Um, Everything. I put it. I, I say put it all online. I, why, why would you hide anything? Yeah. If you're doing the right thing, there's no reason to hide anything from people. It just it's it's aggravating. You know what's happening today in Washington is no different than what's happening over here. Okay. Sorry, Paul, Dale. Paul. Well, I was going to say you you mentioned uh, that's what the government ought to do. I don't know what experience you may have with either running or being part of any elected office or I ever having worked at I a don't. job? No. Okay. I don't, but, I've, but, I've, but I've, I've helped build and run this business, and I can tell you this. Uh, <clears throat> when the guys came in to buy us, they wanted to know. They were not going to buy us until they made sure we were, you know, can, can we really vet you in a way that, that do due diligence so we're not buying a pig in a poke? I think as a new board, we're walking in probably in, on a pig in a poke. And, and I don't think anybody on that board, short of maybe Webbo, who's been on there a while, has any idea about the real inner workings and the underbelly of this thing. And I, I so I'm, I think we got to find that out. I think we got to do it quick. I think Roy McCoy, is that his name? Yeah. Been there. He has. That's right. So you're right. Yeah. But I don't really know him. Okay, GMA 14 has uh, at least five other conservation districts. Yeah. Do you know anything about them, where they meet, when they meet, uh, who composes their board, if they have any pumping restrictions, and what volume of water do they, as a group, I guess, pump compared to uh, Montgomery County? I understand that they don't have the artificial restrictions that we do, that, that our 64,000 gallon of I mean, acre feet was not scientifically derived. Now, what they actually have, I, I'll be honest with you, I really don't know. Uh, I went to this water summit in Conroe a couple of weeks ago, and I learned a lot about 
how this whole thing works, how you've got these districts which comprise multiple conservation mm -hmm. districts and they do planning and all of this stuff, which scares the crap out of me that we can have stuff imposed on us by a county who doesn't have anything to do with us and that the boundaries of the aquifer in their eyes are political. They're, they're not aquifer boundaries, they're political uh, boundaries. And so that caused me to wonder about this whole setup that they've got around how to govern all this stuff. But I don't know any of the details. I just know that that scares the crap out of me. What do those people do? I mean, other than make rules uh, about that 64,000, they got a great big building. I guess they got a lot of vehicles. What is it that they do? I can't really tell you what I can tell you this they don't take care of the vegetation outside their building and I and I can tell you they don't use the system that they put in place that's supposed to save water and, and be able to demonstrate that you don't have to drill that you you can you can actually conserve water I think they do some education stuff I, I keep reading seeing that stuff online but for the for the real for the real problems of Montgomery County. If there are water problems, I can't see anything they're doing, to be honest with you. And we saw Tuesday that their own creek is dry, so either they don't know how to take care of water, right. or they're just showing us that they're not using right. Well, go look at their flower beds. They're supposed to have this wonderful cistern system. They, they, could, they took me on a tour. When I went to sign up, butter wouldn't have melted in their mouth. They took mm -hmm. me on this big tour. And I'm looking at this going, I wouldn't be showing people this. Mm -hmm. If this is what groundwater conservation is about, please don't. Don't put this on me. So, from what you learned at that meeting, and I was there too, yeah. um, and, and your takeaway from that, and knowing what you learned, what's your strategy for assuring the most affordable and sustainable water supply? Yeah, I, so, so here's Keep, the... Keeping in mind that we now have a ball and chain around our neck in the form of a big note that we got to pay off yep, yep. on that five hundred million dollar albatross. Yeah. The lake. So one thing I've learned in business is you don't put good money after bad money, right? I, I've learned that. I, I've learned that uh, that kind of, uh, of a hindsight bias gets you in big trouble. So I don't know. I really don't know yet what you know. Do we need that plant? Do we even need it? I don't know that. I really don't. I mean, we maybe we do need some. Maybe there's a places where they, you know, where they're locked into this. There's no way out of it. I don't know. I don't think so. Because how were we furnishing water for all these people before they built that albatross? Right. Um, I'm not opposed to seeing that be sold to somebody who could actually use it for something good. Uh, I, I'm, 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 not opposed, I'm not opposed to any level of rollback that we can do and be ethically, legally, and morally right in doing it. So, you know, if we, if we shut that plant down and we still had to pay that note off, that's better than operating it for the next five years at a loss. I mean, you're just pouring more money in. So. However much we can roll back, I intend to see to it, to try to see to it and work with the other directors. So let's roll that back, whatever that is. But let's don't put any more good money into a bad situation. That, that's a, to me, that's a non-starter. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much we can, we can roll back, but I, but I will tell you this. For the amount of money that's being paid to that, those people in that building, in that building for what they're delivering, I can tell you that can go away, most of that can go away pretty quick. I can get it off the cyst size, put two of them in it, probably accomplish more than they're accomplishing. Okay. Yep. Okay, the building you're referring to is the Lone Star GCD building? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, an outhouse compared to the SJRA building. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I'm sorry, your, your I, I, I get angry about this. Your conversations, oh. in my mind, seem to go back and forth between what SJRA, SJRA is doing yes. and uh, Lone Star GCD is doing. And uh, If you sold the Lone Star GCD building, would that be used to offset ex 
the debt on the SJRA building? Can you, uh, is no. that legally doable? No, 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 no. I, I, so my deal is you've got to separate these two. So SJRA is in the business of making money. They sell water for dollars. Lone Star doesn't sell anything. What Lone right. Star does is they block us from using groundwater, forcing us into being SJRA customers, right? So the first thing you got to do is separate those two guys. Those two agencies should never have been commingled. Mm -hmm. I understand. Right? So how would selling the Lone Star GCD building help? Well, that won't help. That will that will not do anything about. Uh, SJ, oh, the SJRA building or the Lone Star no, building? Lone, I thought that you were referring to the Lone Star building. I'm referring to the Lone Star building. What I'm saying is uh, we are paying money, good money, for a building that's sitting over there that I can't really see the use for. Okay. So, so now I can be wrong about that. I suspect they bought that property and I suspect that they built that building. I suspect that's not a lease. And what I'm saying is, I, if you look at what they're delivering, it looks to me like what they're delivering is a place for the Lone Star people to meet, the directors, and put this stuff off on us. And then there's some minor educational stuff that I see going on there. So how is selling that building help with the SJRA? I don't think it will help with the SJRA. So okay. I think it's two separate issues. So I would sell the Lone Star deal to help take down the debt, the bond debt, if I had to, or whatever, whatever debt I could use it on, get rid of that, that directly affects the residents. Let SJRA pay for their own stuff. But let them figure out how to go out and gin up customers on their own instead of using Lone Star as a, uh, 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 a hired gun to create an environment where they can force stuff on us. Let SJRA go take care of their own self. Uh, I can't do anything about SJRA as a Lone Star board member. Right. What I can do is I can push them away from the table and say, you don't belong at this table. Go away. And no longer, and I can change, I believe, in fact, I know we can change the rules to say these artificial uh, groundwater uh, protection groups, yes. we don't need them. We're going to get rid of that regulation. And that, my friend, cuts the knees right out from under SJRA. Because without that, they don't get any pass through. Okay, Bob? Have you had a chance to look at the budget yet for the upcoming year? No, I haven't. I have not, to be honest with you. And let me just tell you why, why I haven't spent a lot of time on that. If everything is as crooked as I think it is, that budget is, to me, is, is meaningless. I mean, it, it's, I can already assume that I, I would probably disagree highly with it. Because I can already tell you they budgeted for that building. I can already tell you they budgeted for all those trucks. I can tell you there, there's all kinds of, without even looking at it now. And until we get an audit also, I, I just, it, it's just hard for me to get over the details. My focus right now is to win this election. And because and, nothing's going to change if those guys stay in power. It's just, it's just that simple. Or one of their minions gets elected. And so I'm 100% I'm focused on that right now. And some of these details, I wish I had time to get to all of them, but I, but I, but I just haven't. And, uh, and I'm not going to say I have, so. How is it that Kathy Jones became the manager of GMA 14? And under a new board, where anything related to, to GMA 14 going to change? Does, does the Lone Star Board have any input to the construction of GMA 14? Well, I don't think Kathy Jones likely to have a job, to be honest oh, with you. she that. wouldn't be an employee? Yeah. Okay. She may have a job, but she ain't going to have that job. So, so, so let me, I'll just be straight up about it. I don't think anybody over there, except maybe a low-level administrative staff, who have jobs. Mm -hmm. I don't think they can stay. I mean, they've been in this thing up to their eyeballs. And Kathy Jones, for sure, has been one of them in their up, up to the eyeballs. So, uh, you know, you what know else anything, we can do about that? You know anything about the GMA board or how big it is or how there people? I don't know how it? big it is, but it's, it's, uh, it's not small. Is it appointed? I think most of it is appointed, yes. Right. Don't, don't hold yeah. me to that, that all of it is, but I, I think most of it is. Well, let me ask you about subsidence. You know, when you when you finish talking about running out of water, 
everybody says we need all this because of subsidence. Yes. And people in the woodlands claim that they have subsidence. And I'm guessing that if people measure subsidence, they've done it for a decade or two. Do you know anything about what's happening in Montgomery County and particularly in the woodlands? So I do know a little bit about that. Um, I can tell you that in Montgomery County in general, there has been no evidence of subsidence. Now, that doesn't mean there hasn't been some subsidence in a couple of places. And, and the bottom half, bottom part of the county, the very southern part of the county, there are a couple of places where it, it's highly likely that there has been subsidence. I haven't measured it myself, but everything that, that I can read on it says there has been. Now, in the one place where everybody agrees there has been subsidence, uh, Harris County or the city of Houston put in some pretty serious <coughs> wells in the shallow part of the aquifer. So mm -hmm. I lived down on the, on the coast and we had subsidence. We had a horrible subsidence. But they were pumping out of the Chico aquifer. And, and they were pumping pretty shallow well, level wells. And you can cause subsidence. The groundwater in Montgomery County that most people are taking water from, the large amounts of water, are out of the Jasper Aquifer. And so, number one, that thing is chocker blocker full. It's chocker blocker full. And if you ask any hydrogeologist, is the aquifer full? Or is the aquifer depleting in actual amount? They, they'll, any of them that will get on a stand and raise it, will tell you, yeah, it's full. Uh, but when you get down on the Gulf, down closer to the Gulf Coast, they pump out of the shallow layers and they did cause, and I mean I'm talking about big chemical plants, that's the reason we put in the surface water plant. And they did cause some subsidence. And so I, the Harris County, I believe, wells over on the, on the, uh, or Houston, over on the edge of Montgomery County, pumping out of, who are shallower wells, I think have probably caused some of that subsidence. And we know in Houston there are areas where there is dramatic subsidence, but once again they're pumping out of the Chico aquifer. And you can go places and see pump slabs that are this far off the ground. But you can't find that in Montgomery County anyway. There's wells here that have been pumping for 50 years, and the slab is still firmly on the ground. It is not, and right there where the well is, which is where the pressure is going to be the least. Talking about flush with the ground. Flush with the ground. Right. So. So when, when people talk about subsidence here in Montgomery County, it's, it's not a problem. Not a problem. So the, um, uh, one of the questions, general questions, was how much subsurface water is contained under Montgomery County? 183 million acre feet. Okay, so as in oil and gas, we always look at, you know, that's in place. Yeah, but there's also what's economically recoverable. Yeah, what so kind of percentage. So clearly, not all of it is. We know that, just like in oil and gas. Mm -hmm. So th there are a lot of people have different opinions about what's recoverable. Um, best guess, when I look at the four or five opinions I've looked at, it's somewhere between fifteen and thirty percent is likely to be recoverable. Okay. Now, there's a huge difference between this and oil and gas. Oil and gas does not have recharge. Water does. So, if we were talking about an oil reservoir, and I would tell you, you can know how much is in there, and you know how long it's going to last on a given pump. You cannot do that with water. You, you can't do it. We have a huge outcrop here. Nobody knows for sure what the recharge rate is for these aquifers. Nobody knows exactly what that is. And uh, so the fact that the, we've been pumping out of these aquifers in Montgomery County for 50 or 60 years and the aquifers are still full, what does that tell you? Are you aware, has, has anybody uh, modeled this with uh, 3D, which is uh, static modeling or 4D, which is dynamic modeling, which would show the recharge, would show the water in place and the recharge. Well, I know that they, I know that they, they, they do know, they do have a way to know 
Uh, and I, I don't know what kind of modeling they would use for that, but I, I do know they know the aquifer. You won't find one hydrogeologist who will raise, swear in front of a, on a stack of Bibles that he's telling the truth and tell you that the aquifer is is depleting, is being depleted from with water. If they're full, they'll tell you that. They will also tell you that when you see a, a well where they have to lower the motor, it's basically it's basically what you're seeing is a lowering of the artesian pressure. That's what's happening. Mm -hmm. And and then the minute they shut that well off, you start to see recovery. So immediately, it, causes a it just causes a that well. And that, and that is the friction of water moving through sand. That Are they using that as a measuring tool, that under depression, to say, hey, our water levels have dropped down? They're using it as a fact they'll recharge if you turn the pump on. They're using it as propaganda to, to support their. But what they're, what they're, when they say that, they're lying. I mean, they're, it's just not true. It's not true. I can create a cone anywhere. Right, right. right. Okay, no. Okay, I have not read all the studies. I probably haven't read all of them, or you've read a lot more than I have. But the one that I did come across, and it was actually a website, reducedflooding.com, uh, they actually made the claim that the Jasper is being depleted at 500 times the recharge rate. You said the Jasper is full. How do I know what study to believe? Well, uh, how many have well, you digested so far and so forth? Here's, here's what I will tell you I have read opinions that the jasper is being depleted. But when I talk to true hydrogeologists, and when we look at the U.S. Uh, geological, whatever it's called, they all say that the aquifer is full. It is not being depleted. But yet, people use this propaganda, the, you know, well, we had to lower the wells, we had to drop the wells down 235 feet. And what they're describing is lower artesian pressure. They're not, and they're using that. And most people, you see a graph that says the well was at 135 feet, and now it's at 250 feet. Well, we're running out of water. Well, no, we're not running out of water. And in fact, the further down that that level goes, the quicker the recharge, the more recharge. And you will hit an equilibrium there where the recharge can keep up with in that cone. So that cone will only get so large because the further down you go, the more recharge that comes in. You're lowering the artesian pressure. So all the water starts moving in that direction. And I guess one of the best things for, or one of the most interesting things to me is I live in Moston Manor, which is right at the bottom end of the outcrop where the recharge starts to occur and water's running out of the ground over there. The artesian pressure is so high, it's pushing water out of the ground. That's the Jasper outcrop. It's probably the Jasper outcrop. Could be the Evangeline, but I think all of them come up right, right, right along that line right there. And our RT, I, I wish somebody would, I wish Quadvest would come over there and sink a, a well right in the middle of our neighborhood and pump 5,000 acre feet a year out of that well alone so the water would stop running out of the ground in Moston Manor. Create a cone under Moston Manor because we can't even build pools. We've had our builder have to buy back three homes in there because they can't even they can't even get a swimming pool in there. There's so much artesian pressure it's pushing the water out of there. So my study, so to your question, I think you if you go look and say is that a scientific study? where they said that, what you're going to find is it probably isn't. And if you look at the, the, the real, the, the guys who have really been in this hydrology game for years and years, and you read some of the gurus of the hydrology, they all tell you it's not true. It's just not true that, it would, that we're running out of water and it's going to take 500 years to, to recharge it. It's just, it's just not true. What was that to the world side then? Reduced flooding. Yeah. Um, was that was that a Boggs or whatever name was it wrote that? Who, no. You know? um, uh, a guy just wrote it. Bob Rehack. Who? Bob Rehack. Yeah. So go read some of Mike Thornhill and and read their read some of their stuff when they when they've done a lot of studies. Did Quadvis have a well in his Yeah, they do. They have two of them. They, they're not pumping enough. 
Okay. And they're public. Here's the deal. So let me tell you one other little fact that's really important. There is a 50 foot wide, deeper, wider in some places, less than the other, strata called the Beaumont something or another between the Jasper and Evangeline aquifer. So and when they drill a well, when they get down to that, they have to change bits because they can't punch through it. And it is impervious. So you could probably empty the Jasper aquifer and not have any subsidence whatsoever. If you could pump that much water and empty it, the likelihood you've got a lid on it. You got a lid on it. So it's like I could take a pile of sand and I can push my hand in it, right? But if you put a sheet of iron in that pile of sand, that's as far as my hand's going to go. I can't go any. I can't push that sand down any further. And that's what we have between the Evangeline and the Jasper Aquifer. So, to me that completely negates this notion that you can pump out of the Jasper and have subsidence. I just, I, I, it's not true. Okay, well, to go along with the subsidence, um, I didn't get here until um, 97, mm -hmm. um, but from what I understand, the Woodlands and Kingwood both of which are in Montgomery County, some of Kingwood, and some of the Woodlands is in Harris County as well. Um, most of that was underwater. It was wetlands. No doubt. And they brought in millions of tons of soil to build it up. I actually watched them do that in Kingwood. Did you? Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't see it here because I didn't, I used to live in Crosby. Um, and we moved to Atascacito, which is right next, and I watched them. We had once, once thought about moving over there. I'm not a geologist. Um, I, I know that I understand. I don't know for a fact that there's um, two faults in the, in the woodlands um, with the shifting of a fault and just with shifting of soil in, in its own self over the years, uh, especially if you're taking it out of the, the upper, the, the, the shallow rock. Right. Yep. Um, the, the chance of that subsiding is, is much greater. And, and that's why I believe that, in, in, I don't know how to prove it, but that's part of the issue with what we have in Montgomery County where we don't have it in Conroe because we haven't done that where the, where the wells are at. It wasn't filled in land that, that that's taken place. Um, your thoughts? Do you think well, that's a possibility? I, 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 don't, I don't doubt that. I don't know that either. I can't, I can't testify to that, but I can tell you that, for example, in our neighborhood, they came in, as they built every single house, they scooped out the lots eight feet deep, took that nice topsoil away, and came back with pure clay. Every house is floating on a pad. And yet, so the house is on the pad, no problems. You get four feet out from the slabs on those houses, the water's coming out of the ground. And so the builders in Montgomery County are, are and I'm assuming the Woodlands had to monkey with this stuff because we really do have a situation where the artesian pressure in, in, in a lot of this county is higher than the ground level is. And so the only way you can deal with that is either build the ground up a little higher or put it on an impervious slab. And in the case of Moston Manor, they built clay dams is what they built. They set the house on top of the dam. And they did that in every single... I can go over there and show you. They're building a couple right now. They're putting the pads in right now. And they did it for every single one of them. And if they had them, and three of them it didn't even work on because they just floated until the slabs broke on them. But, but the point is that they, they, couldn't, they couldn't have built those houses if they did. I can take you over there and show you a two-inch stream of water that in the hottest, driest week of the summer didn't even begin to slow down. And it's running right out of a culvert. They had to put in a 360 foot French drain that's this big around. And it's draining all the water from, from about eight homes, backyards, wow. into that French drain and running it into a ditch. And it never, ever stops running. Ever. Mm -hmm. And so, I, so the only reason I say that is I think that's not uncommon in, from what I can tell in some of these neighborhoods of Montgomery County. And so I think, yes, they have monkeyed with, with the environment in a way that, uh, 
it could lend itself to that. So that's the only way I can answer that. Okay. Do you know if there are a series of monitor wells in Montgomery County? You know, there's thousands of wells here. Yeah. And uh, you would think it'd be pretty easy to monitor those levels all across the county. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that there are special monitoring wells, but I can tell you that uh, there is some oversight of a lot of the water wells. In, in other words, there are people are looking at that. Now, whether Lone Star or San Jacinto, and I, I don't see why San Jacinto would, but Lone Star might have put in some monitoring wells. I, I really don't know. I know we've got some in our neighborhood. When I say monitoring wells, they came in and drilled and put these porous pipes in there and they've got them capped and they come, the builders and the developers all came in there and they were using those things. But whether, you know, whether Lone Star's done any monitoring or not, I, I really don't know. I really don't. Well, there's thousands of wells and to get to the oil and gas, you got to go through the water. So there yeah. ought to be a whole lot of information available. Well, here's the thing. They should have, if they were going to do this, they should have done monitoring. If they had, they done the right kind of monitoring, which we used to have to do in the chemical business. We, we had a lot of chemicals that we stored in open pits back in the day, and the government came in and told us, you've got to make sure the stuff isn't leaching into the water system. And we drill monitoring wells everywhere. And if you really want to know what's going on, you've got to drill monitoring wells, not just in one spot, but in, so the cone, I can drill a monitoring well and tell where a cone is. I could also look at the water well there and tell that. But I could also go outside of that area and drill one and say, ah, it is a cone. So I have much higher artesian pressure here than I do here. But I've got a well here, and I don't have one here. So they could have easily proved whether this is a emptying of the aquifer or a cone of a reduction of pressure issue. And I, I, so if they have them, that makes it even worse. Yeah. Well, one of the guys on the board is in the water well business, right? So he's yeah. the, and, and I bought hundreds of wells in this county. Yeah. And that ought to be pretty easy to come across. It ought to be. It, it, it ought to be. You're right. And, and I can tell you this. If one of the guys on the board has a well company, I can bet you that Lone Star has a bunch of monitoring wells. <laughs> well, it, isn't that the wise sinker that drills water wells that's on the board? Mm -hmm. Or maybe yeah, it's it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's pretty, uh, there's, there are people on that board that have relatives with engineering companies that have worked, right? And John Blatt was an engineer. Yeah. So Another problem, huh? Okay. So, all right, so last question. All right. Uh, and then we'll do the re your, your four minute closing, yep. or five minute closing, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so, so in yeah. a, one, one of your, in the other category, the question right. was what political party have you affiliated with over the last 20 years? Do you believe in the party platform, all of it, or percent part? If percent, what describe what you disagree with? You said you affiliate with the Republican Party. You probably agree 75 percent of the time. The spending is too high. Yep. You said there's too much power invested in the top leadership of the party. Yep. Can you explain that? Is there too much power? In the RPT chair, in the SREC, or where? where I, what are you referring to? Well, so so I didn't. I, I knew at a national level there was too much power when Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell can do some of the shenanigans they've done. That's purpose. So so I knew at a national level it was a problem. I also knew at a state level it could be a problem. I've seen. I didn't know. So like I said, I, I, I really am remiss in my knowledge of local government. I haven't been, I'll just be honest with you, I hadn't been minding my P's and Q's. And then I went to this meeting in Conroe the other night, and, and I watched an abuse of, an attempted abuse of power that was scary. I watched the chairman of the Republican Party try to bring in an outside person to help him achieve, I don't know what goal, I don't know, I mean, I, don't, I, I still don't know enough to know, except to keep him, I guess, in power, or keep him whatever. And a duly elected parliamentarian was kept from doing his job. And it got so, and, and bless the heart of a bunch of those people who, who really, <laughs> 
It was like buttering a wildcat's ass with a hot knife. He, uh, they, they had him upside down. And even the constable, David Hill, tried to get involved. And he got shouted down. He got by the, by, I guess, by the precinct chairman. And finally, this guy gave up and, and abandoned the podium. And a young guy that I met not long ago and, and, and really liked and, and I've had a lot of conversation with, he's helped me a lot, is, is Reagan Reed. And he stepped in and took the meeting over. And then things began to move forward. But I mean, they literally wasted the time. He, that man wasted the time, hour and a half time of literally 200 people. And, and that shenanigan, that tells me that the power that's invested at the top of this thing is just, it's got, it's got to go. And, you know, that's just one example of it. But, but I also see county commissioners and people like that who really don't, they're not doing what they ought to be doing. When I look at the appraisal district and I find out that they're actually, I guess, appointed by or on the board. Yeah, and, I, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Really? So, so we have a, we have, we, we have the same problem locally, maybe worse because you're, it's more intimately connected, but it's the same problem I see in Washington, D.C. It's a class of people who become political elites and, and, and see themselves as some sort of privilege. I'm, so let me just tell you my, oh, I'll tell you my closing. That's, so that's where my answer. So they're Republicans, but they behave like Democrats. Or worse, crooked. Crooks. Crooks. Yeah. The, it's a mafia. And I, and, I, and, and I, it's just wrong. It's just wrong. Well, go ahead and take, uh, we've got five minutes, four minutes. Uh, five minutes. Okay. Three. So, so what I wasn't able to do in my opening, let me, let me close with. So there are, there, there are multiple issues here that I have become passionate about. And, and let me first say this, that by getting engaged in this the way I have, it's opened my eyes to the issues that we've talked about here around the politics in, in this county. And it's caused me to want to get involved because I didn't see it before and it's sort of like my eyes have been open now and I'm pretty passionate. But I guess the first thing that angered me in closing about this water board thing was more the property rights issue, which we haven't talked about much in this, in this area. And I am a firm believer in individual property rights. I, I, uh, look, I, I, I can't make up my mind completely that there is never going to be a case where eminent domain could be invoked, but by and large, it better be an emergency. And it better be some sort of national emergency if you're going to do that. And you're going to have a hard time convincing me even then there's not an alternative that would be just as good. So I'm a, I'm a huge property rights guy. And what Lone Star and San Jacinto River have essentially said is the water under your property does not belong to you. You cannot do with it as you please. And that was the first thing, I guess, that really, I mean, really got my blood up. Now, the more I dig into it, I look at the economic uh, stress that this is putting on people. I mean, the economic, and for no, for no good reason. And then the third thing that really angers me is the corruption. And we, we have the greatest company, country in the world here. And and in fact, in spite of all the stuff that I've uncovered about Montgomery County politics, this is still one of the better counties to live in. I can tell you I lived in Harris County, and I've lived in Galveston County. And I will tell you, they, don't, they can't hold a candle to life up here in Montgomery County. But then when I look at the corruption and I look at what's going on, and I think, how good could it actually be? Now, that scares me a little because I don't want the whole world moving up here. At the same time, but but by the same token, when you put those factors together, the fact that individual property rights are being eroded. Number two, there's a willingness to, without uh, representation or transparency, to be able to tax people to the point of of hurting them. That's a, that's a that's a freaking problem. And then I guess the you know sort of the third thing for me is the uh, is the integrity and the, the corruption that, 
and, and, and it, people lose confidence in their government just because of this stuff. And I, I think we can change that. I, I, really, I think this board has the opportunity, if, if the seven guys that are running for the board that, that I affiliate with, that I, if they win this election, I think we have the opportunity to show the county something. To show that you can get people in there who are willing to be completely transparent, open, and who will actually do more than be transparent, actually reach out and try to understand what the community really wants and needs and get them engaged. And I don't see that happening. I mean, I just don't see it happening. So that's, for closing, for me, that's the that's reason I'm in this race. That's the reason I chose to do it. And I, so far, I have not taken a penny from anyone. I've spent all of my own money on this. So this isn't an issue where I didn't take this seriously. And, I, and I'm not asking, I got a donation thing on my, but I haven't taken one donation because I haven't had to spend more money than I can swallow right now. But I, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to do this in, the, in, the, in a way that nobody, nobody owns me. And, and Eric Yalek said something to me that, that stuck with me. He said, I'll tell you what I fear. I fear that you get up there and one of these guys puts their arm around you and the next thing you know, before you even realize it, you've moved. And that's, that, that, that stuck with me. And I, and I see how that happens to many of the people who are up there. Many of them. Even good Republicans who went up there to be good Republicans are now less than good Republicans because exactly of that. And, uh, anyway, that's, that's my close. All right. Well, thanks very much, yeah. and appreciate you coming in. I appreciate you guys doing it. You uh, and I like, and I enjoyed the questions. I, uh, I they gave me a couple of things. I got to go dig into a little.